this is an absolute honor. Um, this is my 20th year as head of school. And Mr. Taylor started Eagle Brook when I started Eagle Brook as the head of school. So you were very brave, you know, to start a school with a new, with a new head of school back then. And he graduated uh, two years after he started. So I'm going to read a little bit about um, what Mr. Taylor wrote and a little bit about what I wrote 19 years ago. Eric Taylor is a 2004 graduate of Eagle Brook and is also the founder, chief executive officer, and chief um, investment officer of Trident, a private equity firm focused on buying and selling small businesses. Trident is special for two reasons. One, it uses sophisticated technology to make investments, and two, it focuses on diversity and closing the racial wealth gap by ensuing ensuring to focus on hiring and promoting minorities and women. Eric started his Eagle Brook journey as a fifth former. Hailing from southern Texas, he lived in what was at the time Macy dorm, now Taylor, and played five different sports in two years. JVB soccer, varsity water polo, which he was captain, varsity swimming, swimming of which he was captain, track and field, and ultimate frisbee and his favorite class at that time was anthropology. This is what also I said about, about Mr. Taylor. He is a big fan of John Grisham and J.R.R. Tolkien, which is very appropriate because we were talking at dinner tonight about reading period, and I know each and every one of you have a free reading book. Eric clearly appreciates the challenge of a strong academic program and one of his teacher here who was, who was very um, influential on him was Mr. Sirmati. And his personal commitment and well-developed study habits should enable him to continue his success at a challenging secondary school. school. Um, Eric also is a, r r um, a strong reporter for the Eagle Brook n newspaper, The Heart. As a member of the CARE Committee, Eric has assumed an invaluable role in the process of social inclusion. Th is fitting of what you're doing now as a professional. The new year, the the new peer mediation mediating group is one of the most honorable at Eaglebrook. This is the care committee. It was called at that time. His musical interests range from singing for the ad libs. He also, I I learned that I I forgot his assembly. He did a break dancing Michael Jackson um, intro. Some of some of our faculty remember that. Um, ranges for singing for the ad libs, um, uh, the a cappella group, and playing saxophone at that time in the school band. Um, he was a responsible member of the dormitory, serving a, as a dormitory proctor and as a reliable big brother to a new student. So maybe Mr. Taylor will remember who the new student was and share that with us. But let's give um, Mr. Taylor a warm Eagle Brook welcome and wonderful to have him up here. Awesome. Is, is this thing on? Yeah? yeah. Awesome. So, so um, I, I remember Hilly Chase, and uh, I remember that there was a whole range of uh, folks who would come in and speak. Some I, some I thought were very interesting. Some I thought were less so. Um, but what I wanted to do today was um, a couple things. A, give you guys some background on who I am, uh, allow folks to ask questions, um, but I want it to be interactive. You know, if you're thinking of talking to the person next to you, probably not a great idea because I'm going to come right up to you and I'm going to call you out. I'm probably going to have you ask me a question. So, um, but, but I think we're, you know, it's, it, we're, we're, we're going to have a little bit of fun. So my name is Eric Taylor. Uh, I graduated in 2004 from Eagle Brook. I was here for two years. Um, you know, Eagle Brook was one of those places that um, was like sort of mythological to me growing up because my dad had actually gone here. Um, uh, and yet I knew really nothing about the school. I'd like come up once or twice to visit, you know, seen the big hill, seen the trees, and was like, yeah, that sounds good, I'll go. Uh, and was effectively thrown into it my fifth form year, uh, but ended up loving it. I mean, I, I didn't call my parents for like a month and a half. They were trying to figure out what was going on, what was wrong. 
Um, and as it turns out, I was having a really, really good time. Um, as Andy mentioned, I did a few things while I was here that I'm really proud of. Um, you know, I was a writer for The Hearth. Um, I was a soccer player. So when I was a kid, uh, growing up in Southern Texas, I actually fancied myself to be very good. Um, I ended up trying out for the varsity team. I got cut, uh, ended up being on the JVA team for a couple weeks, got cut, <laughs> um, and then ended up on the JVB team. And that was like the most heartbreaking moment. I remember I was sitting at dinner, it was like a Tuesday night, um, and Mr. Wister, who I don't believe is here anymore, came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, was like, hey bud, JVB is really mu a much better spot for you right now, so that's where we're gonna have you. It was, it was like the worst moment ever, but um, for a lot of reasons, it actually turned out to be right. Um, I was a swimmer. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you guys a story if I have some time, but my dad was a basketball player here. Um, you know, I had to, I had to, uh, A, learn that swimming was the right sport for me, and then B, uh, sit in what was then Mr. Moulton's house at the time and call my black father and tell him that I was not going to be playing basketball like he wanted me to, but was going to be a swimmer. Um, to which he replied to me that the last time he'd see me, seen me swimming in a pool, I came in last and there were multiple girls in the pool. Um, but I, I, I tell all of these stories because these are sort of the building blocks to what, you know, I became later on. Um, you know, that transition, for instance, from basketball to swimming, that was the first time I made a decision on my own. And, you know, when I talk to parents, when I talk to faculty, when I talk to students about Eagle Brook, I think one of the real magical pieces of this school is it gives you the opportunity for maybe one of the first times in your life to make really, really critical decisions um, that will help, I think, inspire uh, and guide you for the rest of your life. Now, um, the end doesn't always just depend on the beginning, right? You can always make changes and we can sort of talk about, you know, how you will adapt as you grow. But this opportunity that you guys have in front of you to really set uh, a, a sort of agenda uh, uh, for yourselves, to set uh, boundaries for yourselves, to sort of figure out who you are, what you want, what you're destined to do, what you're good at, this is, this is such an important time and I'm, I'm so excited for you guys. Um, you know, quick details. Look, so after Eagle Brook, uh, I went to Exeter. Uh, I was also a water polo player and swimmer there. Um, ended up also doing track. Happy to talk about the secondary school admissions process. Happy to talk about uh, anything that you guys want to know there. Uh, after Exeter, I ended up going to Harvard and Boston um, and ended up majoring in social studies, so sort of a mix between philosophy and economics. The reason I say that is because philosophy and economics has absolutely nothing to do with finance and private equity, which is where I ended up. Um, so what I wanted to learn about and what inspired me as a kid uh, and, and obviously as a young adult really had nothing to do with my job today. I just, did, you know, I just started investing time and energy in what I was interested in, uh, and it all ended up working out in the end. Uh, and then I started a business. So I, I decided to become an entrepreneur. I'm not going to bore you guys with what private equity is unless you really want to know. You're welcome to ask questions about it. But the biggest thing I would say is that entrepreneurship is its own funny little beast. Um, you know, much like the decision I made to switch from basketball to swimming, while uh, very, you know, in retrospect, it could seem like a small decision. That was actually my first venture into entrepreneurship. That was the first time taking a risk, jumping into the unknown, uh, and really having no idea how it was going to pan out. Um, now, that ended up panning out well. Two years later, I was an All-American. But in, in similarly with my business, things have been going very well. But again, uh, you know, when I say that, hey, you're in this position today to build, uh, I think, an agenda for yourself, start setting the culture of what you want to do, who you want to be, I, I really mean it. That, that stuff actually matters. So here's what we're going to do. I actually have a list of everybody who's in the room. I'm primarily going to call on the six formers, um, but yeah, I told you. I, to, I told you it was going to get intense. Um, so, wh why don't we do this? I'm going to allow volunteers first, 
If I don't get volunteers, I'm just going to start rolling up to you guys and, 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 ask, and, and tapping you on the shoulder and making you ask questions. So um, I put these questions up because I don't know what you guys are interested in. I'm 33 years old. You guys are 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I'm so far away from you that I don't want to talk at you uh, and be talking about stuff that you guys aren't interested in. So this is an opportunity for you, if any of these questions are of interest to you, to ask. Uh, or just ask your own random questions and we'll just riff and we can go. Otherwise, I can just talk at you. I'm also happy to do that too because I, I do a lot of talking all day. So I, I'll, I'll let a sixth former volunteer. Otherwise, again, I've got a list of you guys. I'm going to start calling out people. Go ahead. Uh, I did start Trident. If you're thinking about Trident the gum, no, I did not start that company. So, um, let's maybe back up, like from 30,000 feet. Like, why is finance important in general? Um, Everything in this room has to be paid for, right? Like this microphone has to be paid for. What is a microphone? Uh, well, it looks like it's got some plastic, it's got some wiring, it's got some metal. That means that there's a company that bought a bunch of different things and in some manufacturing process put it together. Well, let's imagine, for instance, you know, you're that company and you're starting from scratch today and you want to buy a bunch of things and build a manufacturing plan and put all that together, you're probably going to have to raise a little bit of capital, right? You're going to need some money to do it. Maybe you need $500,000. Well, my point to you is that finance is important because finance allows for companies to get the capital that they need to build the goods and services that you and I interact with on a daily basis. So that's, that's like the basis of what we're talking about. Um, I'm, I have a private equity business. That means that I buy and sell companies that make things like microphones. I'll give you an example. I just bought a company in northeastern Alabama that manufactures 20,000 doors a week. Um, why is this important? Well, when you think about this country, there's about 3,500 companies that trade in the stock market today. But there are about 30 million small businesses in, in this country. And generally in finance, what you've seen is that you've got really big financial institutions, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, right? You guys know the names, that end up skewing towards investing in really big businesses. And they end up overlooking small businesses. And so what me and my team thought to do was to build technology that would allow us to find the small businesses that, again, build things like doors or microphones or, you know, lights or whatever uh, and give them the capital that they need to grow. So that's why it's important because we're investing in sort of an overlooked part of this country. Go ahead. Great question. So, so the question was, how do you transform from majoring in social studies to uh, going into finance? I'll actually take it a step further. I wrote my thesis on Karl Marx um, and a bit of his critique of capitalism. For those of you who don't know who Karl Marx was, you know, uh, uh, he's a communist. So literally the opposite from a theoretical perspective of what I do on a daily basis. Um, but, but, but here's how. Look. At the end of the day, a lot of these jobs and careers aren't rocket science. Don't let anybody convince you. Uh, I don't care if they're using, you know, fancy words or fancy abbreviations. You know, generally that'll be because they simply have more experience in these sectors than you guys do. What is going to differentiate you is whether you're passionate whether this is something that you actually want to do. And then you guys are obviously all smart, so you guys are going to be fine. So I say that to say, if you're doing what you want to do, if you're doing what you love to do, um, there will be value in that, not only to you, but also to the world around you. The worst thing that you could do, 
long term, again, right now, like, you guys got to do math. You got to eat your vegetables. So don't, like, you know, wake up tomorrow morning and say, I don't want to take English class because Eric Taylor told me so. That's not what I'm saying. But the worst thing that you could do is end up on a career path that you don't like because somebody else wants you to. And I, and I really, really do mean that. Um, why? Because if you don't like it, if you don't enjoy it, if you're not inspired by it, if you don't see yourself having a future in it, you're actually not going to do well. When you think about the people who are best at their jobs, right? I don't care if it's like Jeff Bezos who founded Amazon or LeBron James or Bill Gates or really whoever, right? Think singers, actors, whatever. They all have one thing in common. They really, really love what they do. Really love it. And then, you know, it really helps if you've got, you know, a sort of divine set of talents that allow, you know, LeBron James happens to be also 6'8 and like 250, 260 and can dunk better than all of us put together, right? Um, but it's the combination of those two things. It's the passion for whatever you're doing and obviously the intelligence to pull it off. So that's how I did it. Yeah, good. We're going to have you use the mic so we can ask questions. All right. What do you look for when, per like, purchasing a company? Like, what is valuable? And then after you purchase it, what steps do you take to, like, make the company more valuable? Really good question. So, um, what, what, so, so, so um, what do we look at? When you're thinking about how to value anything, um, and I, I, I really don't care what it is, um, the way all investing works, and don't let anybody convince you different, is at time zero, meaning right now, money comes out of your pocket, and at some time in the future, money comes back into your pocket. That's really the basics of it. Uh, if money comes out of your pocket and it doesn't come back, it's not an investment. That means you just lost money, right? Um, and so the way we analyze companies is we have to project out, obviously, A, how much money does it cost to buy this company, right? In the case of the business I just bought, it was a $45 million business. So we paid $45 million for the company. And then we had to think, okay, well, how many doors a year do they manufacture? What's the price of those doors? How many employees do we need uh, in order to manufacture those doors? How do we make sure that the doors are actually cut in the same way every single time? How do we ensure that the employees are happy enough so that we're maximizing productivity? How do I call the top 10 customers of this business and say, hey, do you want to buy more doors? I literally did that, by the way. And all of them were like, yeah, we love doors, right? So um, we're, 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 we're always thinking about what we call the fundamentals of the business. But those sort of qualitative factors give us information on what we think the annual cash flows of the business will be. Now, remember th what I said at the beginning. You make an investment, some money comes out of your pocket, and then the value of that investment or the worthiness of that investment is based on how much money is coming back into your pocket over time. So we take those qualitative factors, and then we build out what's called a financial model where we actually forecast out that profitability, and that helps us determine whether or not to buy something. Right there, NASA. What has, what has your experience being a person of color in, in the world and in Eagle Brook for you? Yeah, great, great question. So, um, look, I, I think one of the things that, a, as a person of color, um, especially if you want to be high performing, you're going to have to deal with is imposter syndrome, right? This feeling that you don't belong. Um, I'll give you two quick anecdotes of how I experienced it. One, um, I was a swimmer and a water polo player, um, which meant that not only my team generally, but also the folks that we were competing against generally didn't look like me all around, you know, around New England. And I remember one time I was, um, I can't remember where we were, but I think I was at Exeter at the time. And um, at the beginning of a water polo match, everybody lines up on either side of the pool, and there's two people who sprint, sprint against each other, right? And 
I noticed that the person that I was sprinting against also happened to be a person of color. And for a split second in my mind, I said, oh, good, he must not be fast. Isn't that crazy? For a second. And then I looked at myself, and I'm like, uh-oh, hold on a second. <laughs> wait, wait a second, what's going on? Um, implicit bias is real. And I was judging somebody. At, yeah, I, I hadn't met him. I hadn't seen him swim before. But I had been so used to this idea of what a fast swimmer or what a good water polo player looked like that I even forgot who I was. By the way, I was the fast guy in the pool. Pretty much generally, like, all, you know, at Eagle Brook, all throughout high school, I was always the fast guy in the pool. And I'm black. So that's the, fir that's the first story. The second story is um, I was uh, uh, captain of the swimming team at Exeter. And I remember, like, having not like a mental breakdown, but, but feeling really, really frustrated because I felt like there was a wall between me and my teammates, who, by the way, were, were, were all white, mostly from New England. I'm from Southern Texas. So socially, we just were not jiving very well. And I, I couldn't figure it out, because by the way, I'm captain, right? I'm supposed to be big man, big man on campus. I'm supposed to get along with everybody. But I, I, I felt so disillusioned because I couldn't figure out how to make things click. W what I can tell you is that that feeling is something that you might experience for the rest of your life. I still go into rooms sometimes, and I'm like, man, I'm uncomfortable for a second. But there's two things you really have to work on, and this is for everybody in the room. A, don't judge a book by its cover. You do not know what that person's thinking. You do not know what that person's background is. You don't know what they're good at. You don't know what they love. You don't know who they love. You don't know what their, who their family is. And so as long as we're all sort of seeking to learn about each other as we get to know each other, that helps prevent some of that bias from, from bubbling up and, and you know, um, you, you ending up with the sort of adverse reaction that I came up with, that, that I had. Um, the second is, where, where you belong in terms of where you're supposed to live, who you're supposed to live with, where you're supposed to go to school, what you're supposed to do for work, you also can't judge. Like, I can't tell you what your path is going to be. I can't tell you if in 20 years you're going to be surrounded by people who look just like you or people who don't look just like you. It might go either way. But if you pre-code and pre-expect um, your path to be one way in terms of who you're with and who you're relating to, I, I actually sort of think that's how you get off sides. And it's sort of related to the first point again, right? So it's like don't judge the other book by its cover, but like also don't judge yourself, right? You, like you can't, you can't pre-program who you are. You can't pre-program you know, who you're relating to. You can't pre-program what expectations you have for yourself socially. And I think the importance and beauty of a place like Eagle Brook, by the way, is that you now have the ability to test yourself out with all different kinds of people. I mean, it's like, it's, it's the most beautiful. Like, I had a Korean roommate. I can handle chopsticks perfectly, and I've been able to do so since I was in eighth grade. That's the kind of thing that actually, like, matters. I mean, it really does. Um, I learned a little bit of Korean, mostly curse words, unfortunately, but I learned a little bit of Korean when I was here. Um, but, but my lesson, you know, the lesson was taught to me really early on because of this school that, like, my best friends, um, my coworkers, my colleagues, uh, the people in my life that I care about the most are really from every, every quarter. Um, and if you allow yourself to not only have um, a diversity of people around you, but a diversity of experiences, then I, I think you'll be better off for it. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying be colorblind. 
right? I'm not saying ignore the fact that you sometimes feel like an other. That feeling is natural and it'll come up. Don't let anybody tell you that it's unnatural, you, should, you shouldn't feel it. Like these are emotions, people, right? I mean, you know, like we're all human, we're all going to have feelings, we're all gonna have emotions, but the key to becoming an adult is having these emotions and letting them flow over you and being able to handle them with dignity. And that's, the, that's my challenge to you. I know you guys were freestyling. Did we even need these questions? Um, uh, your, your company, Trident, is a private equity company, right? Correct. Um, is your company similar to other companies like KKR or Oak Tree? And if not, um, what are the differences? Uh, y yes, similar, albeit smaller. Um, but, but, but yeah, the, the basic idea behind these businesses, um, and it's a very attractive business to be in, is, um, you know, believe it or not, there's a lot of money out there that's floating around that needs to be invested. You guys know what a pension is or like retirement savings is? So this idea that if you work for 40 years, for instance, uh, a p little piece of your paycheck goes into an account, every paycheck you get. Um, and let's say you're somebody like, I don't know, the state of Texas that hires a lot of teachers. That's a lot of paychecks. And they all go into one account. That account has to be invested because when people are 65, they need to retire. And when they retire, they don't work anymore. They get what's called a pension, an annual payment that allows them to live out the remaining years. Those dollars end up getting invested with companies like mine, with companies like KKR and Oak Tree. So it's a massive market and we charge fees. So I take 2% of every dollar that I manage on an annual basis and then I take 20% of every dollar of profit that I make. The, qu the question was, how important is dating? Um, well, it's super important to me now. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, guys, guys, guys. So, so look, I, 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 I put that up there because I'm not sure anybody at Hilly Chase has ever talked about dating. <laughs> uh, but it was something that I was thinking about when I was a sixth former. Um, look. This is something that will come, okay? Like, everybody in here I know, you know, like you guys are all boys, adolescents, et cetera. It will come. What's going to happen is as you age, there are gonna be lessons that you learn. And most of those lessons end up being something like this. Man, I was really focused on this thing and I should have been focused on this thing. I can tell you one of those things is dating. Okay, this is something that you're probably going to put entirely too much time, entire, entirely too much energy, entirely too much thought towards. And then when you're me, you're going to come back, you're going to be given a hilly chase and be like, dang, I really wish that I'd done more shooting, you know, in the basement of the gym. Or like, hey, I really wish I'd done more carpentry classes, uh, uh, you know, while I was here. Because that was a really cool experience that now I just don't have time for. I've got time for dating. But like the bevy of experiences that you guys have, the, and when I say bevy, I mean range. Like there's so many things that you guys could be doing on any given day or any given weekend. Um, that, and again, I'm not telling you don't think about it because that doesn't make any sense. You guys are young people, you're going to. But don't, don't obsess over it, th th there's, there's no need, it'll come. Bold question, by the way. Was it third, are you third former? <laughs> nice. With your knowledge now, what's something you wish you were doing when you were younger? Um, something I wish I was doing while I was younger. Um, y 
you probably won't expect this answer, but I, I played a lot of video games when I was a kid. Um, like, I was a really big StarCraft player. I was a huge Diablo player. Um, I never got into World of Warcraft because that's, like, too cultish for me. But, like, I was a, I was a serious, like, either MMORPG or strategy game player. Um, and I played so much, but it's unfortunate that I never thought about the bigger picture with these video games. You know, I, I was, like, playing in the Eastern realm or the Western realm, or I play, like, in the Asian realm, and I knew that there were thousands, if not millions, of people playing video games, but I could have never foreseen that there would be Twitch and YouTube channels and high school esports teams and stadiums being built for people who also love these games. Again, I used to play with these people. I saw them. I knew that, they, I knew that this was you know, something that people really cared about. So what I would challenge you guys is, again, just getting back to your passion. Video games, when I was growing up, was one of those things that could have never been seen as being productive, right? That was just like what you did that your parents didn't really want you to do, but they had to let you do it because it was your hobby or you liked it or you enjoyed it. But now, there are people who own esports teams. There are people who do operations for esports teams. There are people who are on esports teams. I mean, that is a real business. And I wish I'd been a little more thoughtful about that. So the message for you guys is there's going to be something that each of you is really, really good at. I can't tell you what it is. You probably know what it is. right? There's going to be something that you really love. And if you just take it a step further and think about the big picture, who else loves it? Is there a venue or a community for whatever it is? Um, you know, do people pay for it? If so, how much? You know, using what kind of currency? All these sort of big questions, again, about something that you probably know about anyways because it's your hobby. I, 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 think, I think that's what I would have done. Where, where did you think your career was going like when you were in sixth form? I want to be a doctor. Um, you know, my, my dad's a doctor. I, I want to be a doctor. And um, specifically a cardiologist, because my dad's a cardiologist. Um, I, I took biology. It was, it, I was okay. I took chemistry, and I was terrible. And my dad majored in chemistry, so I was like, okay, hold on a second. This might not be, <laughs> this, this might not be for me. Um, and then... You know, I interned in Congress my, my senior year in high school, senior at Exeter. Saw all these people with fancy suits walking around with briefcases. I was like, these people seem important. They seem like they make a lot of money. I want to be like them. Went to Harvard. A lot of folks are going into finance. So I did that. I thought that made sense. But, like, I didn't have this, oh, I'm going to start trying in this private equity firm, and we're going to do well while doing good, and we're going to buy small businesses, like, door companies in Alabama when I was in sixth form. I didn't know. I had no idea. And by the way, Trident's still developing. We're coming up with new ideas every day. D don't fall into this idea that you need to know what you, like, what you want to do for the rest of your life right now. I actually think that's really dangerous. Like, don't impede your own creativity. The, the way that you guys are going to create value and actually be happy doing it is by two, like nailing two things. One, like get your fundamentals down, right? That means like every class that you're taking right now is actually kind of critical. So like just like nail the fundamentals. And then two, whatever you're really good at or whatever you're really interested in, be really good and be really interested in that. And if you have that fundamental sort of underpinning and then you have that special sauce of something that you know, only you are good at because only you can be good at it. That's how you become really successful and become really happy while you're doing it. And I say both because there are tons of successful people successful who aren't happy. And there's a lot of happy people who aren't successful. I can tell you, you do not want to be unhappy and successful. I can, tell you, I can just tell you that right now. Money is, good, no, money is not going to be enough to make you happy. 
I, I promise you. Like, life's going to get harder than this, <laughs> okay? You know, you're going to want to build a career. You're going to want to build a family. If you're not doing something that you love, you're not going to enjoy it. And money's not, money's not going to be enough to pay you for it. Um, getting kind of back to Vassar's question about the work that you do in private, private equity when you're looking at companies, you, uh, I think Mr. Chase mentioned that you've developed some technology to really look at the metrics. I'd love to hear about that. But also, I'd also like to hear from you about um, what you look for in a company in terms of, and, and I want to know the metrics about people about management, about the company's story, about them potentially going from one place to another. How much do the people matter? How much is that, does that outweigh some of the other uh, number metrics? Yeah, so, so um, we actually formulated this idea of a private equity firm a little bit differently. The way most folks who want to um, you know, do private equity usually work is they you know, we'll go to Google, they'll find a whole list of companies, they'll get their phone numbers, and they will literally pick up the phone and call them. Say, hey, my name's Eric Taylor. You've got a business that sells doors. I'm interested in doors. I want to buy you. And usually they get a click, not interested. Um, and so the second iteration of that, there's a company called Summit Capital. They basically started, like, building, you know, these sort of boiler rooms where they would have all these really early stage people you know, young people out of college, cold calling hundreds of companies a day. I think that's one way to go about it, but the way we've gone actually, actually gone about it is said, look, well, look, a, a company isn't something on paper. A company is just a group of people, right? Like, if you six right now wanted to start a lemonade stand, and, like, you go get the ice, you go get the wood, you go get the limes, you go, you go get the lemons, you go get the sugar, you go get the water. That's a company, guys. Well, you guys got a company right there. Great. Now you can sell everybody lemonade. So the question's going to be, okay, well, how good are you at getting ice? All right, there we go. How good are you at finding lemons? How good are you at finding sugar? Good. So what I did is I built an algorithm that allows me to say, okay, well, he says he's really good at finding ice, Let's actually figure out how good. And so I'll ask him some questions. Okay, well, how many years have you been finding ice? What kind of ice do you go look out to find? What shape is the ice? You know, in the past when you found ice for other companies, what kind of lemonade does it make? Is it good or is it bad? And we actually put all of those qualitative factors into numerical form so we can effectively judge how good the people that are running the business are. And the simple logic is that you can have a really, really great management team and a terrible company, and that management team might actually be able to create profit. Now, you can also create a really, you can have a really great company and a terrible management team, and, you know, the company could go down into the dumps. So the basic idea is starting with people first um, instead of starting with companies in order to create value. And by the way, when you've got really good people, they will actually uncover opportunities that are otherwise difficult to find. You know, if you want to, like, buy gas stations uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's probably good to find somebody who's been, I don't know, buying gas stations in Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? Find somebody who's been doing it. So we built technology effectively to source that group of people. That's the first mechanism that we use to judge the worthiness of an investment opportunity. You know, so, so it's um, yes and no. Yes and no. I, I've, got, I've got two messages for you. One, um, nostalgia is good. It keeps you rooted. Um, do you want these sticky keys? No. Uh, one, nostalgia is good because it keeps you rooted, right? You always want to remember where you came from. But two, a lot's going to change. Right? Life's going to come at you fast. It's funny. I actually got a LinkedIn message this morning from an old buddy of mine from Eagle, a guy named Ray Lee. We used to be on the swim team together. And it's crazy because Ray didn't even know that I was, going, I was doing Hilly Chase today. He just 
you know, hit me up out of the blue. Um, what's cool, I think, about the friendships that you're making right now is that, say these, the, the, these two fellas, if you, have, if you don't see them for 20 years, you guys are going to be, you guys are going to basically pick, off, pick up where you left off. And that's really, really cool. The second thing I'll say is that a lot's going to change, right? Like, and a lot's going to change for you even at Eagle Brook over the next three, four years. Uh, then you're going to go to prep school. Then you're going to go to college. Then you're going to go to a job. The ones who are most successful and, again, happiest are the ones who are going to be receptive of that change. I'm telling you shocks are coming. I'm telling you changes are coming. Um, and you will be better off if you learn to adapt and flow with that change. Now, again, you want to stay in touch with these guys. Why? Because they're going to keep you rooted. They're going to say, hey, I remember you when you were just wearing wrinkled green plant pants and pink socks and, you know, et cetera, right? But, but that's something that you're going to really appreciate in 20 years, let me tell you. All right. Oh, man. You guys, now you guys are made? Okay, all right, go ahead. <laughs> My least favorite teacher. So, I, so it's funny. I, 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 and I, I, I mean this sincerely. I literally did not have a least favorite teacher. Like, nobody really messed with me when I was here. Um, you know, you can take, take what you want from that. Um, my, my, my favorite, there's a really clear answer there, was Bo Tanner. Um, Bo, I think her first year was my first year, right? So Bo, I mean, Bo changed my life. You know, Bo was the person who grabbed me and said, hey, you're not a basketball player, you're a swimmer. Um, Bo was somebody who, when I was at, at Exeter and I was feeling homesick and I was tired and disillusioned, you know, I, like, drove out to her house in Massachusetts and, and spent a weekend with her. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, I think the really cool thing about this place is that there are people here who see you in a way that you don't yet see yourself. Um, like, as in they'll see something in you or they'll see potential in you. They'll see what you could become. And you can't see it yet because, you, you like, it's sort of hard for you. you like, it's almost like you're missing the forest for the trees, right? Like, you're so close to the tree, you can't see that there's a big forest behind it. And that's good, right? You do want to be focused. But there are a lot of people in this room that really, really care about you, right, who decided to spend all their time in Deerfield, Massachusetts, on the top of a mountain, you know, in many cases cut off from the rest of society for you guys. <laughs> Literally, right? Like they've dedicated their lives to y'all. And I think that's so magical and that's so important um, because it means, again, that they're going to spot things before you do. Uh, and for me, my personal experience with that, that was Bo. Uh, I'll answer that real quick, and then, yeah, I did point to you. How old do you have to be to, in, to intern at Trident? Um, that's a good question, man. We don't have any high school internships yet, but I'd consider it, you know? Shoot, out, shoot, shoot me a resume. It's got to be well formatted, one page, del delivered within the next week. Uh how hard was it to start your company, and did you ever feel like giving up? Oh, my God, absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, absolutely it was hard. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, and did I feel like giving up? Absolutely. So here's the thing. Um, not everybody experiences this, but a lot of folks, when they start a business, they do it in, in a sector that they think they know really, really well. Right? So you'll be sitting there like, oh, man. You know, within this, like, little corner of the world, I am the man. I'm the best at this. I was making all this money. I was living in New York City. I had a high-rise apartment, going out to nice dinners. And I was like, you know what, Eric? You are so darn good. You should start your own business. You know, not only can you do this whole thing, you can do your boss's job. You can do your boss's boss's job. And you got it all figured out. Um. Fast forward six months, 
I had no team, <laughs> okay, had barely raised any money, um, had this idea that I was really passionate about that I knew would work, and I was on a shoestring budget, so I was like walking everywhere. And you, I don't know if you guys have ever been in New York City in the summer when it's raining. Okay. Well, have you ever done it in a suit that, and by the way, like a suit that you're not supposed to sweat through, and the rain is kind of going sideways. And I'm on the way to a meeting, actually, with, with Jim Neary, and I was, like, literally cursing at myself. I was like, what are you doing? You left your cushy, high-paying job uh, to get rained on because you don't really have enough money to buy cabs or anything like that, right? You're walking across town to a, to, to a meeting. Like, uh, my, my suit is wet up to here. Um, and I was going to, like, what was probably the hundredth meeting where I was pretty darn sure I was going to get rejected. The key thing about entrepreneurship is you're going to get told no a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean, like, all the time. As if you meet with 100 people and ask them to invest in your business, if one says yes, that's pretty good. I mean, that means you got something. Usually it's going to be zero. Um, and that's not because it's not a good idea. It's not because you're not smart. It's not because you're not passionate. It's just how the game works. It is so, 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 so hard to come up with something that the world has never seen before and then convince the world to spend time and money on it. Right? Because if the idea was, was so good, why didn't KKR or you know, Oak Tree or Apollo or any of the other big guys do it? Right? You know, if your drink is so good, well, why didn't the folks who own Gatorade do it first. So you're always fighting against what we call incumbency. But that's kind of what makes it fun. Because they're incumbents, because they've been doing it for so long, they'll miss things that you don't see. And as long as you keep fighting for that thing and you got a good idea and some passion behind it, eventually you'll win. How important are the SATs? Um, yeah, uh, so I, I, I've I've been I, I've been out of the the I've been out of the SAT SSAT game for a while. Um, but he, here here's here's what I will say. Um, I took my last standardized tests like not that long ago, and I'm 33. Um, testing generally is a mechanism that folks use to help determine where you are, what you get into, right? So my girlfriend's a lawyer. She had to take the LSAT, the LSAT. Then she had to take the bar exam to actually become a registered attorney. I had to take the CFA exams in order to become a chartered financial analyst. I had to take the SATs to get into college. I had to take the SSATs to get into prep school. So um, when I was coming up, they were super important. I would imagine that test taking is still important, but I, I actually wouldn't even think about it as like, hey, I need to do well on this test. In life, for anything that you want, there's just going to be hurdles. Some of those hurdles are pretty dumb, right? Uh, some of those hurdles are annoying. Some of those hurdles take a lot of time. For example, my CFA exam, it's three exams that you have to take in order. You can only take it once a year. Each exam is six hours. You have to study 300 hours for each exam. Okay? I had to take it six times because I was failing so much. I studied the equivalent of 75 days, as in if I studied 24 hours a day for 75 days straight, that's how much I studied to get at my CFA. And that was like recently. That wasn't that long ago. So my point is that, and by, and by the way, there, 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 there are a number of reasons for that. But my point is that um, the judge here is when things are thrown in front of you, however pedantic, however annoying, however detailed, however time intensive, however difficult, you got to chew it up and spit it out. You got to attack it. You just do. Um, and 
you know, I think folks will spend a lot of time agonizing over why things are a certain way. And sometimes it's the folks who just put their heads down and rush through it, knowing that what they actually really want to do is on the other side, that, that end up really successful. I can assure you my girlfriend did not want to take the LSATs in order to get into law school. She probably thought it was a little silly at the time. But it actually ended up turning out really well for her because now she's a lawyer, double barred attorney, all that. I can tell you the CFAs have turned out very well for me. But, you know, was I cursing up a storm while I was studying for it? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, here or? Oh, yeah. That's right. What what would the return be to Eagle Brook ten years from now? Oh, ten years from now. Well, so so here here's the thing. Um, so I'm I'm gonna teach you guys a lesson real quick. If somebody asks you, hey, how much money I'm how much money am I gonna am I gonna make? Uh, you you ask them, well, how much more money do you want to put in? <laughs> 